Good afternoon to everybody who has joined us. Um, I don't know whether people can see me or hear me. Um, I hope you can. Um, my name is Julio Davila. I am Professor of Urban Policy and International Development at the Bartlett Development Planning Unit. And I'm delighted to welcome you all and to welcome our special guest today, Professor Eric Febvre, who is talking to us from Nairobi, as you can probably see from his background. He's there, he's just hunted a couple of hyenas and he's joined us uh, to talk about um, zoonoses. Um, sorry, no, I didn't mean hunted. I mean, I, I meant, you know, he's got pet hyenas, so he, he, did, he has them in his garden and so on. Uh, so Eric, um, we, so I'm just looking, checking the attendees. We've got a uh, good number now. So I think we'll, we'll just kick off. Um, so thank you all very much uh, for this. Thank you to Dana, Susalimbu and Alex. Uh, McFarlane and Haim Jacobi who've organized this. This is one of a um, series of webinars we hold in the series in DPU called Dev Dialogues in Development. Um, and uh, we invite guests like, um, special guests like Eric, who can expand our knowledge on subjects that we ought to know a little bit more about and we don't or we know a little bit about, but they bring in additional expertise to us. In this case, we're bringing somebody who comes from a very different world to uh, the planning built environment world that we are all in, because Eric uh, is a professor of vet veterinary infectious diseases. And he's based, as I said, in Kenya in the International Livestock Research Institute um, in Nairobi. Uh, he has been working on with a group of epidemiologists, ecologists, biologists, veterinarians, and medical practitioners uh, on the issue of re-emerging diseases. Some of you may know that a lot of the infectious diseases that human beings have are of zoonotic origin. That means that they jump from vertebrates to us either through different hosts or directly in some different ways that I, not being a biologist, don't quite understand. But, but they're very important. And of course, they're very important even now, uh, or more so now than in 100 years, because we're in the middle of a pandemic, which is caused, it is believed, by precisely one of these pathogens, one of these illnesses that jumped, it is believed, again, from a bat somewhere in Asia to probably uh, an interim host, pangolin probably, and then on to humans who consumed it. So um, <clears throat> Eric will probably touch upon this subject because he is a real expert, I am not. On, and it is an important subject, not because we're in the middle of a pandeg pandemic, but it, because infectious diseases will be with us, have been with us for thousands of generations. And, um, uh, they will be with us uh, for many generations to come. There are thousands of viruses out there that we know very little about, but we do need to know how they can harm us, how they can actually harm uh, you know, others, and especially what we can do about them. Um, and as Eric will point out, no doubt, as we live closer and closer in cities, as the world urbanizes, these uh, pathogens, these infectious diseases, are um, becoming more important uh, of, of this kind. And we've learned it in a very painful way around the world. Uh, so it's a fascinating subject, but it, what fascinates me, and, and thanks to Eric and all the colleagues from the biomedical sciences, is that I believe that we coming from the built environment um, sciences or built environment angle, as planners, as architect, as engineers, we can contribute a lot to managing these uh, illnesses uh, to, because it's in cities that these viruses, a lot of these will spread more quickly and continue to do so. So insofar as cities are uh, places where we have exchanges, um, this, this is important for us. And, and Eric invited me to this project that he is going to mention on one of these projects because he's worked on several that he, uh, about, eight years ago, probably. Uh, and I learned huge amounts. And this is about um, a pathogen called E. coli that, again, jumps from animals to uh, animal hosts to human beings in different ways. It is not a virus. 
Um, so it doesn't mutate, it's much more uh, easy to trace. And he will probably mention that, or we can ask him about the details of that. Um, the genetic elements of it are completely beyond my knowledge, my understanding. Um, but uh, but it, it was a fascinating collaboration among several disciplines, and he will talk to, to, to us about that. Just to remind you, you can ask questions as we go along in the Q&A function of the webinar uh, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and you just have a little thing that says Q&A, obviously. Uh, just try to channel your questions through that means. Um, try not to use the, the chat uh, because then it means we've got to be, be looking at different, different things, but I'm going to have the help of Haim, Dana, and probably Alex too, too if, in case I miss any questions. Eric will speak for about 35 minutes max, and then we means we will have about 20 minutes for questions. So we, we're finishing at two o'clock London time. So Eric, um, please go ahead and welcome. Thank you very much, Julio. Uh, and thank you very much to the DPU and uh, UCL for the invitation to speak at uh, today's event. Um, I'm just going to share my screen and hope that that works. Julio, can you just let me know whether you're seeing my screen? I am. Uh, yes, you. Yeah, I am seeing it now. You need to just make it bigger, sort of. Okay, brilliant. It's in. Like, it's in lecture mode now. Excellent. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks again. Um, so yes, thank you for that introduction. And indeed, I'm going to be talking to you this afternoon about studies on emerging zoonotic diseases in urban environments, which was the subject of a large program that we operated uh, based here in Nairobi um, in a very multi-institutional collaboration. Uh, I'm a staff member of the University of Liverpool and jointly appointed at the International Livestock Research Institute in Nairobi and so have a bridge, I bridge those two institutions. Uh, which is a really privileged position to be in, and uh, I, I take the opportunity to thank uh, both Liverpool and Dilry for um, for uh, you know, encouraging this kind of work to, to happen. Okay. Um, right. Um, un Julio mentioned at the beginning that there's a lot of biology. There is a lot of biology in what we've done in this program, of course. But I'm going to try my best to make it as relevant as I can to the develop to the to the planning community, and I, I hope I manage to do that. I'm not a planner myself, but I've uh, I've absorbed a bit of the the priorities and the thinking that that comes from from that uh, sector a little bit, and so I'm going to talk about how the biology relates to planning in particular, and so that will be the primary focus, and I won't go too deep into the technicalities of the biology, but do feel free to ask me questions about that if you wish. The first thing I want to say is that a program like this, uh, everything that I'm going to be talking about, is really about, very much about the people who did it in the first place. And I can't mention them all by name, you'll see from that, that picture that there's really a great many people, I think we counted about 70 individuals in the end who were involved in this program, and a multitude of different institutions that, that were involved in. You can see the logos down there. So thank you to all of them um, without uh, taking the time to name them uh, individually. Thanks also to the Medical Research Council and the other UKRI uh, research councils who had the foresight to fund this kind of interdisciplinary work under a banner which they entitled Environmental and Social Ecology of Human Infectious Diseases. So that tells you a little bit about how broadly they as funders were thinking before this started and how broadly we were encouraged to think when we were putting together this kind of program. Um, the CGIAR system, particularly the Agriculture for Nutrition and Health program, also funded a lot of this work, as did the Leverhulme Center for Integrated Research on Agriculture and Health, which is based um, in Bloomsbury in, in, in London, so close to, to the DPU itself, and also the Wellcome Trust that funded some specific aspects, but which, whose funding was also extremely important in, in doing this work. Okay, so um, pathogen emergence in urban environments. Um, what do we mean by emergence? We mean the appearance or the increase in incidence of, uh, of a, a new pathogen or of a, of a known pathogen. And a perfect example of that, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to mentioning 
uh, COVID-19 several times in, in this talk, although this is not really about COVID-19, but some of the principles certainly apply. But COVID-19 is a really good example of a pathogen that emerged out of nowhere um, about a year ago and that has been very successful in spreading. And so a lot of our work is concerned with trying to understand what result, what makes something emerge and when something does emerge, uh, how it spreads through populations once that happens. And a number of risk factors have been identified for this kind of emergence. Ecological change, agricultural development, urbanization and demographic change, and we'll come back to that of course. International trade, globalized industry, and adaptation of microbial organisms to new populations. And pathogen emergence, as Julio mentioned at the beginning, is linked to non-human animals. Um, there are very dynamic ecological, social, and um, environmental and evolutionary interactions between uh, different hosts, and that can lead to the jumping from one host to another. And in fact, about 60 to 75 percent of emergence events that we know about are zoonotic. That means the pathogen that came into humans emerged out of uh, a non-human host. Okay, And the graphic there is really just to show uh, how much goes on on the left-hand side of that graph, or the interaction between wildlife, between vectors, between domestic animals, or all the dynamics that happen before anything really pops up in the human population. So it's, it's really about trying to understand what's going on on the left side of that before we get into that red peak which is uh, the, 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 human, uh, the human element of these kinds of outbreaks or epidemics or indeed pandemics. Okay, so in terms of emergence of pathogens, we want to focus in this talk on, on urbanization. And here we're trying to understand the, the mechanisms that lead to the introduction of a pathogen into an urban environment and its subsequent spread. So on the previous, uh, previous uh, slide, we said that yes, urbanization is a risk factor for emergence. That's great, but actually mechanistically, how? What has to happen to allow something to pop into an, uh, into an urban environment and spread once it gets there? Our focus is very much, has very much been on livestock as the sources of these pathogens, but where livestock are part of wider ecological networks that involve wildlife, humans, and, and others. As Julio mentioned, our focus was on E. coli. I won't really talk much about the, uh, the ecology or biology of E. coli in this talk, but when, when I refer to our results on pathogens, I really mean uh, E. coli as an exemplar of a multi-host pathogen. So E. coli is a bacterium that is very well adapted to multiple hosts, and we have very good tools for understanding uh, the, the genetics and the biology of E. coli, so it makes a very good model uh, to, to understand some of these processes. The focus of the, the talk, and indeed this entire project, was very much the city of Nairobi uh, in Kenya and the hinterlands of that city, and indeed the agricultural regions that supply it with food. And we focused on uh, um, multiple components of the city. We really tried to uh, disentangle all the elements of the city that, that may have a role to play in this. Looking at livestock commodity value chains, and I'll mention a little bit about that in a moment. Looking at actors and the organization of the food system. A lot of mapping, geographical mapping, institutional mapping, which was undertaken by colleagues at, at the DPU, and genetic mapping. Lots of microbiology and landscape genetics, and I'll come back a bit to that. Urban planning and looking to the future, trying to understand how uh, some of the findings that we had in a project like this need to influence the way in which we structure the li living environment uh, that, that we, that we, that we build around ourselves. Of course, lots of public health comes into this, and there's also uh, there are a lot of nutritional elements. And I won't cover all of those in this talk. It would just be far too wide-ranging. Really important concept that I'm going to come back to over and over is that of the interface. An interface is uh, defined as a, a point at which independent systems or diverse groups interact with each other. In, e in ecology, uh, an interface is a physical place. It's an edge or a boundary. The seashore, for example, is an interface between land and sea. Um, but there are interfaces all over the, 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 the natural environment. And these tend to be zones of disturbance, zones of interaction between species, zones of genetic exchange, zones of competition for resources, and of course, zones of pathogen transmission. And so these interfaces are really important 
uh, in understanding uh, how microorganisms might, might spread around. And uh, Odom, an ecologist in the 1970s, uh, said that there was a tendency for increased variety and diversity at these community junctions or interfaces. And that, for us, is really key because it's that variety and the generation of that variety that creates disease risk. Okay. But interfaces aren't just physical places. Um, in sociology, uh, an interface can be defined as not a place, but a process, a very dynamic process of social change is also an interface between different social groups, uh, between environments and, and, uh, and a social environment. Okay? And these physical and biological and interfaces that I mentioned a moment ago exist within the context of these social and, of course, policy interfaces which guide the way that the world changes around us. So the physical world that we often measure is influenced by the non-physical uh, interfaces that are also all around us. And disease transmission at those interfaces can be facilitated or hindered by interventions in any of those spaces, by biological interventions, by uh, interventions to uh, affect the physical space, or by social or policy interventions that change the way interactions might happen. So all of this is interrelated, and understanding how they interrelate really does matter a lot. Okay, well, let's come to urbanization. And my apologies to those of you who are specialists in urbanization who know more about this than me, but it's, uh, this will serve as a reminder that there are massive increases in, in the population of urban and, and peri-urban uh, areas in uh, sub-Saharan Africa particularly. And by 2030, it's estimated that 50% of Africa will be urbanized. So the population will be growing across the continent, but it will be growing faster in urban areas than elsewhere. And so those urban areas are definitely set to grow. And this has impacts across the scope of, uh, of uh, human welfare and well-being and the, everything that we do, including disease transmission. So these are the demographic trends. The big graph is Kenya. The smaller graphs, which you probably can't see any detail on, relate to uh, the world and Africa at large. But just look at the Kenyan one. And we see that the population of Kenya will, which is currently about uh, 50 uh, million people, will be uh, uh, somewhere in the region of 150 million people by the end of this century. So really big, big growth with more than half of those people um, in urban environments. So things, things are changing and things are changing fast. One important area where, that has where these changes will be uh, seen is on the demand uh, and consumption of animal source foods. Um, in these, uh, these graphs, I'm sorry, the circles are in the wrong place. They should be slightly to the, to the right. I'm not sure what happened here, um, uh, focused on East Africa. But really what they show is that the demand uh, and uh, consumption of animal source foods is going to grow massively um, for milk in the top graph, monogastric meat, so uh, poultry and pig meat, and ruminant meat, so cattle and small ruminants like goats and sheep on the bottom. And in all cases, th these uh, modeled projections show a big increase in, in, in demand and in consumption. And so we have to feed, essentially, these growing urban populations that themselves are no longer producing their own food by building more complex ways of bringing food to those people. Okay? And bringing food to those people creates in of itself a new and very relevant interface for disease transmission. So a value chain is really a, a, a chain that, that shows the the, the supply of a product and everything that leads into creating that product from one place to another. In this, place, in this case, this is a cartoon version of uh, uh, going from a farm through to an abattoir, various transporters to a butchery, and then to a household that is the ultimate consumer of that food. And this can be a very short chain. It could be that the farm is next door to the household, or it could be on the other side of the world or the other side of the country. And these Chains exist within a, a, a complex policy interface where there's lots of rule systems established that are designed to increase, uh, uh, decrease, hopefully, uh, risks of, of, of things that we don't want to flow through those chains moving uh, within them. But from a disease 
transmission point of view, looking at the urban setting where people are consumers primarily rather than producers of food, these value chains present us with an opportunity of understanding how something existing on a farm that ends up in a household can pick up infection, if you like, or risk uh, along the way. Um, so here are some real-world examples from <clears throat> some of the work that was done in our project. This is the complex uh, milk value chain that supplies Nairobi. This is the complex ruminant meat uh, value chain that supplies Nairobi. And this is uh, the uh, broiler meat and egg value chain uh, that, that supplies Nairobi with, with poultry and eggs. Okay. So if we come back to the cartoon, along that value chain, we can choose to understand where risk is being introduced by taking biological samples at the farm, on trucks where they're being transported, in abattoirs, at butchers, and definitely at the household, and we'll come back to the household as a specific example in a moment, and understand where within those chains r r pathogenically risky things are being introduced into the system that brings something from an animal to the plate of a person who's going to consume it in a household. So for me, these chains very much are in of themselves ecological networks. They're a means of connectivity between urban residents and the livestock that feed those people. The chain itself crosses real-world ecosystems and is an ecological network. The structure of the chain is heavily influenced by the planning environment, where your slaughterhouse is located, where your farms are, which uh, transport routes uh, de determine which, the, the, the way in which uh, food is brought, brought into the city, where the markets are that people access that food uh, in the first place, uh, and so on. All of the, that planning environment has a very heavy influence on the structure of these value chains. And each node in the chain is an opportunity for generating microbial diversity and introducing microbial diversity. And so we can think of the city as a, as a meta-population of uh, connected people, livestock and livestock products, um, and peri-domestic species. So the geography of the city's ecosystems and the way people relate and use their environments uh, really help shape those types of interactions. So one focused example of this uh, was work that uh, uh, a postdoc at the DPU, uh, Sohel Ahmed, did as part of this program. And at the bottom there, you can see the clip from the, the paper that resulted in this, and hopefully the DOI is there also. We can share those later if, if, uh, if it's not visible. And this was uh, very much a mixed methods uh, piece of research, under, uh, undertaking a, a quite an in-depth analysis in some particular parts of the city of Nairobi, and in particular low-income settlements, looking at um, what food people ate, where they got it from, uh, and how it flowed to them. So the, the value chain images that I showed you before really relate to the entire chain from production to consumption. And here Sohel was very much more focused on, on the consumer as the end point in that chain and understanding how those consumers interacted with the food system and, and what environmental interactions could be superimposed on top of that. And this was done through focus groups, observational walks, uh, 660 interviews with, uh, with vendors, and some other quite cool um, uh, mixed methods techniques, which I'll come to on the, on the next slide. And he was looking at uh, the supply of cooked food, of vegetables and fruits, and, 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 uh, and um, raw meat and, and other raw products. So here's the cool bit that I mentioned. One, one element that uh, we were particularly interested in is when food reaches that near consumer level, what environmental interactions does the food or the people who sell it have? And how does that then potentially impact on risk of introduction of, of, uh, of a pathogenic organism into that food? So that red balloon in the central picture there is a helium balloon with a camera suspended underneath it, which was flying over these low-income settlements in Nairobi, taking uh, a picture every second or something like that. And that was then put together to build these very highly detailed maps of these low-income low settlements. And then combined with interview data, with um, self um, uh, self-made maps that uh, the community themselves were encouraged to work with us as a project to, to put together to, to understand where the sellers of food were, 
um, where potential environmental risks were, where waste happened to aggregate, um, where consumers, what routes consumers used to access food, food sellers, uh, and so on. And in many ways, uh, this uh, allowed us to reframe food and hygiene as a kind of a social justice issue within those environments. And in fact, that uh, food-centered justice in informal settlements was, was the title of the paper that resulted from this piece of work. And so, as I said, this was really about understanding the interaction of, in, in the intersection of the food system in these low-income settlements with the environment and with environmental risk with it within those places. So, for example, two-thirds of the vendors who sell food in low-income settlements are physically located on the, on the shore of an open sewer. If you think of a sewer as, a, as, a, as, a, as an open flowing river, and in, the, in those, the, those two pictures you see at the bottom, you'll see what I mean. These are open sewage, um, uh, open sewers, and those people in those containers on the, on the edge of those sewers are food that is being cooked, raw food that is being cooked for sale directly to consumers who walk past those places. And those food sellers are located there, not because of the sewer, but because those are places where there's a lot of footfall, where the clients are, and it also happens to be where other, other things also happen to move through, such as sewage. And so there's this juxtaposition between food, which you'd really like to be the cleanest thing, with sewer, which is probably the dirtiest thing. And this, this work really allowed, uh, uh, empowered, I hope, local communities to integrate elements of gender, knowing that most of these food sellers are female, issues of interaction with waste, I issues of client contact between a, a supplier of a product and the people who buy it, the transport links, the lack of urban space in these environments, and of course food preferences by consumers, which is also a really important element of this. Uh, empower these communities to put their experiences, their knowledge, and the challenges that they face at, at the forefront of, of their approach to how they would like their own environments to be planned and what policy and practice would need to follow from that. So it was about giving communities the, the power to build their own information base, the mapping, the questionnaires, the, the locations of the vendors, all of that was done through a, a, a really interactive process with the community and so that the community could own these results and use them to their favor in, in lobbying their, their representatives uh, and so on to in, in, um, improve the conditions in the place where they, places where they lived. Okay, so stepping away from that now and back a little bit to some of the biology. I said that I mentioned some landscape genetics. So this is what I'm going to do now. Here, landscape genetics is really to understand the genetics of organi organisms at the level of the landscape and where that landscape is the city. So it's how microorganismal -organi diversity intersects with uh, landscape level diversity. Okay. So to do this, we sampled the complexity of ecological niches within the urban space of Nairobi. We uh, had contact with and sampled urban livestock food producers, urban residents, consumers, animals, wildlife and so on within the urban environment and looked at the influences of livestock keeping and, and poverty on bacterial diversity in urban settings. Okay, And we did this through really what was probably the flagship element of this whole program, the so-called 99 Households study, where we selected 99 households across the city of Nairobi that were uh, stratified by uh, sub-region, sub-location of the city. And within each of those sub-locations, sub-locations being the most convenient administrative unit to, to use for this, we selected households that either had ruminant animals, so cattle, uh, goats and sheep, monogastric animals, uh, poultry, pigs, or no livestock at all. And we stratified, we looked at, at these across a socioeconomic stratification where these sublocations themselves kind of indicative of, uh, of, um, of um, wealth groups essentially. And um, collected a huge barrage of data in each of these households around socioeconomic status, livestock keeping, environmental contact, purchasing of food, the way they manage themselves, what inputs they put into their their livestock if they had them, 
uh, and so on, and collected biological samples uh, from everything that lived there, essentially, uh, in order to understand the diversity of the microorganisms that we found. So this is what one sublocation looks like. We randomly selected points and had a and, and then went to the closest household near those points that uh, met the selection criteria of either having large stock, small stock, or no livestock. Okay? And if you remember the um, value chain diagram that I showed you before, where we were able to take biological samples across or along that value chain, we essentially did the same thing here within, uh, within those different households. So in 99 locations, where this map is representing just one of those, we took samples from humans, from the animals, from the environment. Um, we caught rodents, we trapped birds, we took samples of food, uh, and so on, and isolated microorganisms from all of those things. And then we repeated that over and over again 99 times. And it's a huge testament to the, to the uh, efforts of the, the, the teams that were in the field and then in the labs who for over a year did this day in, day out, processing that material. It was very heavy work, um, but uh, hugely rewarding, I think, in terms of research experiences and also, of course, hopefully the, the results. Within each of those households, we also undertook um, a micro, uh, micro uh, environmental mapping to understand the footprint of those households in terms of ecological diversity and how that related to the, to the broader environment of the city. So here is just some pictures of that being done, sampling people, animals, um, catching birds. That requires us to go very early in the morning, catching bats, which requires us to go very late, uh, very um, late in the day, coming into the night, uh, sampling water, standing water, sampling the food, and, and other things within each of those households. And I, I promised I wasn't going to go into any detail of the biology, but I, I just want to show that that fed into a whole value chain, if you like, of biological analysis that led to lots of bacteriology being done in the lab, lots of isolation of bacteria, and then uh, lots of whole genome sequencing of those bacteria to understand the, the real genetic diversity that we had there. So to put that in a bit more of a cartoon, sampling pathogens in the field, collecting epidemiological information from all the people and the animals and the environment that that's sampled from, doing the whole genome sequencing, and then putting it all together into a big phylogenetic analysis, looking at uh, how genetic diversity relates to um, environmental diversity. And again, I'm not going to talk much more about that now, but this is one of the big outputs uh, of that whole piece of work. This is uh, the whole genomes of, um, of uh, uh, almost 2,000 E. coli's that have been sequenced, and this is the sort of tree of relationships between everything that we found. So I wanted to tell you about that because it relates to the next thing, which I will spend a little bit more detail focusing on uh, before I finish. In that 99 households study, we were able to understand how the fragmentation of the ecological environment had an impact on uh, the disease-causing organisms and on the hosts of those disease-causing -ca organisms that were of interest to us. So broadly, Fragmentation of natural habitat in, in urban environments leads generally, uh, if we look across the world, to a loss of species, to changes in trophic structure, meaning changes in what wildlife eats, um, and an increase in non-native opportunist species. So uh, opportunist species that are able to exploit those kinds of very disturbed habitats tend to do very well, and they outcompete what would normally have, what, or what would have been in those environments became, before they became overly disturbed. And you see the same in, in plant ecology. If you walk through a very disturbed forest or a disturbed footpath, for example, you might find lots of nettles around on the edge of that footpath. Those things are there because they're very good at exploiting the kind of disturbed environment that that footpath represents. And then we see a thriving of synanthropes, which are those wildlife species that can coexist with humans. Um, and a homogenation of uh, biodiversity and uh, potentially an accelerated transmission of wildlife disease. And this is really what we were uh, trying to investigate. In the kinds of informal settlements, for example, in urban environments that, that I've shown you some pictures of already, a significant shortage of land. 
and that means that livestock are commonly kept within household compounds, that there's a, a poor management of, of livestock and human waste within those compounds, so it resulting in an increased proximity between humans, livestock, and animals with that waste. And these are resources that attract that synanthropic, uh, poorly diverse uh, urban wildlife. And these um, urban synanthropes act as, or potentially act as hosts for the important bacterial, viral, and parath parasitic pathogens that are our primary focus in a project like this, as well as um, other elements, um, mobile genetic elements, for example, that uh, may be responsible for spreading resistance to antimicrobial resistance around. And so in this project, we used the cross-sectional data that was available to us uh, through the 99 Households study to, um, to understand um, uh, the distribution of uh, mammals and other and birds within within this environment to map uh, habitats within the urban space and to link the presence of species groups to anthropogenic factor and socioeconomic measures and all of that's really summarized in the in the charts uh, at the bottom uh, that um, so on the y-axis there we have household or wildlife diversity and diversity of wildlife goes down the more artificial the habitat is Household wealth goes up the more household wildlife uh, the more household uh, wildlife uh, diversity goes uh, household wealth increases the more diversity we see in wildlife so there's that positive relationship between wealthier households having more diversity and um, the more diversity there is within the household habitats the more wildlife diversity we might see and we can summarize this. In this uh, graphic, this is work that was, all this element of what I'm showing you today is work that was done by uh, a PhD student, James Hassel, who's now a, a, a research fellow at the Smithsonian Institution in, in, uh, in the US. Um, looking at this gradient of urbanization from sort of peri-urban or, or nice and green, let's call it that, to almost no green on, on, on the right-hand side, with increasing wealth, more wealth going left, so um, the left-hand side of this, this graphic is where the wealthier individuals live. The right-hand side would tend to be more the low-income settlements. In a Nairobi situation, that also equates with elevation. Um, there is a sort of underlying geographical thing where elevation also relates to, to that diversity in, in Nairobi. And high habitat biodiversity and high tree cover, the wealthier the, the environment. Okay, With more artificial land use, if we can call it that, on, on the right hand side. And this relates to, uh, to the disease aspects that we're, we're or, or disease causing aspects that we're really interested in. So as we go right into the deeper city, if you like, we see lower diversity of wildlife, as I've mentioned before, but that also equates to high, high densities of those synanthropically dominated, uh, synanthropic uh, species of, of animals. So particularly black rats, for example, or certain species of birds, or, or certain bat species, for example. So there's a lot of those animals around, but the diversity of wildlife overall is much, much less. There's also then, of course, an increase in human density and an increase in uh, livestock density because people are keeping livestock in really very restricted areas uh, with uh, very little land uh, to do that and that comes back to the sort of waste issue that I that I mentioned uh, a moment ago and then that then relates directly back to the epidemiological gradients that we're interested in in terms of the flow of pathogens if you look at those those uh, elements of the cartoon at the top how the natural environment and the built environment interact with the way wildlife assemblages, livestock densities, and so on, all come into play. Of course, those all have big impacts on the microbial community. And what we tend to see is that uh, there's, uh, even if there is more, um, more, uh, di more diversity of microbial community in those areas further away from the core of the city, those elements of the microbial community that are potentially more dangerous to us tend to aggregate on the right hand side of that diagram in the deeper part of the city so there's the hosts become less diverse the pathogens become less diverse but there's a lot more of those uh, of those pathogens and a lot more of the more dangerous pathogens in those deeper parts of the city so the urban the structure of the urban environment is interacting directly 
with risk to human populations. So to sum this up, and this is uh, my one but last slide, the findings that I've put to you today re reinforce the importance of maintaining patches of diverse natural habitats within urban environments in order to increase wildlife biodiversity. It's really important to have wildlife diversity even within the deeper parts of a city. This habitat diversity avoids the formation of artificial habitat ecosystems which may have a lot of animals within them which are but where those animals are, are not very diverse and where where those kinds of artificial habitats encourage alien species that may present more disease risk to us as humans and biodiversity as a proxy for for green space is something planners you guys really need to think about uh, and try to encourage a re-establishment of diversity within those core parts of, of urban environments, especially in those highly altered spaces, because the greener areas are, that has impacts on other elements of, of health, of other elements of non-infectious health, so general health and well-being, asthma, for example, psychological well-being, and can also play a role in mitigating against some of the localized effects of, of climate change within, within cities. Okay, so all of this work is about to appear hopefully within the next week or so, in, in um, the, glo uh, the Journal of Global Change Biology. And I encourage you to go and have a look at that when it comes out. So I want to end there and hope that I've taken you on what ends up being, I'm afraid, a bit of a whistle-stop tour of some of the elements that we had in this project, but where I've, be, I've tried to bring together some of the biology with some of the thinking around urban planning and the way people use their environment. Um, because uh, my understanding is that's sort of the interface that uh, you're working in at the DPU. So thank you very much, and I hope I haven't gone over time. Thank you so much, um, Eric. Absolutely fabulous. Uh, it's, it's so impressive to see it coming together now. And it's, as you can all see, a huge uh, project um, managed by Eric, only Eric could manage something of this size and this complexity. And I must say, I, I learned enormous amounts. I was then uh, director of the DPU, so I couldn't put in as much time as I wished to learn about all these other disciplines. I'm hoping to catch up with that a little bit and, and read more about their angle of the side. So uh, as uh, Eric said, we had Sohel um, as a postdoc who did a fabulous job in, in the kind of work that he um, showcased um, with the balloons and, and the mapping. Um, I've shared um, one article, uh, one of the two articles that he mentioned, I didn't have time to share the other one, on the chat. Uh, that is the, the one on participatory mapping and food-centered justice. I will share the other one in a minute. So we've, we've had two that have been sort of led by the DPU and um, hopefully more to come. We're now currently working on a, on a version of the second one that I'm going to share in a minute with um, Cecilia Takori from IID and, and Adrian Allen, um, which is, uh, you know, we, we, we're hopefully will be published in the landscape in what's it called? The Journal of Landscape and Urban Planning. So this takes me to the point that as Eric said, we as planners, people who are in the built environment can contribute quite a lot to this. As you can see, and Eric couldn't be, have been more clear uh, and vocal about what we can do to this. Um, I'm not gonna say much more. I'm just, we have uh, three questions, which, which I, in fact, I've, they've stolen them from me or I've stolen them from them. I mean, it's fantastic questions, uh, which, uh, we're dying to hear you, uh, your answers to. One is, which I can combine Kelvin Momani and Eleonora Dobles. Um, so uh, Kelvin is asking, kindly share more light on why an increase in the demand of poultry and pork and not beef, how about fish? So it's about our dietary changes. But Eleonora takes a different angle, slightly different. And she says, how do you consider urban planning can support the reduction of transmission of pathogens that originate or give origin to zoonoses? And uh, a second question, what is your analysis of the impact that a widespread vegetarian diet could have in the mitigation of the emergence of zoonoses? Is it realistic to envisage a widespread and popular transformation of our diet, uh, et cetera, et cetera? Um, so I think that that's a question, uh, an interesting one is how will the diet 
change in future. I had a question about that. Your projections are that um, animal protein will increase in Africa, in Eastern Africa particularly. And, and is that so? Can we confidently say that that is the case in 30 years, 40 years time? Okay, thanks, Julio. Thanks, everyone, for your questions. I think um, some other work that we also did as part of this program was looking at um, the nutritional status of, of people in urban environments. And um, it is difficult to get appropriate levels of protein when you live in some of the environments that, that, it, that, that end up existing here. If you're a child living in a low-income settlement in Nairobi, your, your ability to get a, a, a nutrition, nutritious, balanced diet day to day is, is limited. And so access to animal source food or animal source protein is, is really an essential part of ensuring uh, the nutritional status of people. So um, to answer the question about, uh, well, it, that sort of relates a little bit to the, to the question on, on vegetarian diets. I guess that, that could be an aspiration, but at the moment, I don't think uh, the, the supply system is really ready for that. And from a nutrition point of view, we, we really are dependent on animal source protein, which might in, involve, uh, doesn't necessarily always involve killing animals. It might be milk, for example, but there are, milk is definitely a, a way of transmitting many different pathogens. So uh, animal source food protein essential for the nutritional status of people in, in such environments. And I don't think that's going to change in the immediate future. That then also relates to uh, people at the other end of the, the socioeconomic spectrum for whom there is a sort of aspirational desire to consume more of those kinds of products. Um, eating meat in your home on a daily basis becomes a sort of marker of your wealth really in many ways and I guess in the Western world we we often take that for granted we most people probably eat some animal source food protein every day without thinking that it relates to their wealth level but in fact it does the fact that we are wealthy enough to eat those foods on a daily basis says something about the wealth that we have and so people who are who who are uh, the I mean I don't like these terms but the sort of newly emergent middle classes in urban environments will have aspirations to consume those kinds of products uh, regularly. Um, and that's what drives the demand. So why, why pork? Why poultry? Uh, why less so fish? Uh, that's an interesting question, and it may be different in different, different, um, different um, societies, even uh, uh, within uh, sub-Saharan Africa. But um, I guess in a, in, a, in, a, in a Kenyan context, there's a desire for meat. Uh, beef meat uh, is definitely tends to be what people want most, but it's also the the most expensive. So, so the most easily accessible, cheap cheapest meat to produce is poultry and pork. And um, the production industry has responded in kind by really upscaling the production of poultry and pork. And uh, the statistic that I often cite is that pork production is rocketing at 150% growth per year um, to meet the demand of those rapidly urbanizing settings. And I guess the other thing to say about that is that it's not just cities like Nairobi. Um, Kenya, if we just take Kenya as one example, there are 35 or 40 poles of emergent urbanization in Nairobi where where people are, are, are urbanizing and, and um, cutting off their ties, if you like, with uh, zones of production. So there are more and more people becoming consumers and not producers, and it's not all focused on one big city. And, and, and those trends uh, are consistent across those scales. I hope I haven't missed. I try to include answers to all those questions all in one. I hope I, I did that. Is there anything I missed? No, no, that was pretty good. I, I, there's more to come, I'm afraid. Um, no, no. I'm, I'm going to group them and I, uh, to some extent into one uh, from several people, Leila and, and um, Leila and I think Noura as well, which is essentially the role of planets. I mean, you, you threw the gauntlet at us as planets to say, OK, guys, now let's help. And that's what I feel so drawn into this work for. It's precisely what can we do? I think we as built environment professionals have a lot to contribute to this and to urban health in general. Um, it's just that it hasn't been recognized. We need to do much more work because the causality is a difficult one. I mean, there's too many confounding factors when you do research, but what are the policies? So um, 
Leila asked, what are some existing groups of planners, work, planners working on reintegrating white life in urban areas? And Ana Maria um, White Alfaro from Peru. Hello, Ana Maria. Nice to uh, read you. Um, she's worked, her PhD was precisely on this, on, on, on food and street food, if I remember correctly, Ana Maria. Um, uh, how can we work towards policies that integrate urban ecosystems in this complex complexity? And Anura Ali, also PhD, a DPU PhD, a question on the policy side of things. How will you make sure that planners and policymakers process the project's findings and translate them into Nairobi's planning policy and urban development? Uh, you, know, you know, you get the point. It's, ask. it's a huge <laughs> challenge. And I think that one is, a, that's a difficult one. So can you have a go at that? I mean, in other words, how can we guys help uh, as built and yes. Well, well, I, I, I might bounce some of that back to you, Julio, because, uh, yes, on your sabbatical year, maybe, maybe that's your job uh, to do. But um, <laughs> um, in, in this project, uh, I was thinking about this the other day when I was preparing for this, this talk, that our, my, my feel-good interaction with, with the planning community actually was you guys in the planning community, the academic planning community, really, if you like. And I realized that at a very practical level, in terms of the people who really make decisions about should we build this building, should we change the, the gazetting of this piece of land, you know, the, the planning office effectively in, in Nairobi weren't involved in this project at all. And I, I regret that. Uh, I, I feel that they ought to have been. But, but actually then trying to justify that to myself, at the beginning of this process, I don't think we were ready to do that because we didn't really know what some of the important answers were going to be. We didn't really know, or, or we hadn't, we hadn't really properly conceptualized how biology and planning fit, fitted together really well. And I'm convinced now that they really do. So I think actually one end result of this project is that we're now in a much better position to take the results of a project like this, even if they weren't involved in it, to, the, to those uh, very practical planners and put it to them and build on the next things and ask them now, okay, given what we've told you, what other things do you need to know, do you think about, do you worry about on a daily basis around some of these issues in terms of making sure that, that, that the city is diverse, um, ecologically rich, and also serves its human population in the best way that it can. So uh, I don't think I really have the answer to, to how, how we move forward practically now, but I think that projects like this have put us in a much better position to, to, to take the results that we've generated, move away from sort of high-level academic thinking, and actually now think about trying to go and apply some of this um, in, in, in the real world. How, how that gets done in cities like Nairobi, where things are very complicated at a planning level, there's all kinds of other interests, let's just put it that way, that come into play whenever something needs to get done on the, on, at, at the planning level. How do we bring that very broad church of people together in order to think about these things? And how do we empower the planners actually to make the right decisions rather than be pushed into the decisions, which I think happens a lot of the time. And, you know, we, we've talked a bit about urban uh, low-income settlements in, in, in this talk. Actually, from a planning perspective, officially they don't exist a lot of the time. The reality is that from a practical, when I say that, I mean they're not on the map. Um, of course, the planners know of their existence and, and provide what they can in terms of services, lighting, water. There's a lot of examples of that, but still on the map, they're not there. So how do we bring all of that together to sort of move forward practically? I think that's actually where we are now. And I look forward to many more years of collaboration with the DPU to do that. And if there are students listening, I hope that there's a career in some of that for some of you. Um, G. Leslie is asking, uh, so the potentially catastrophic sharing of living space by domestic animals and humans risk transference of animal disease to humans. How can, the, how can this practice be stopped convincing tribal village elders to win over their flock to change their ways? Will there need to be money to have simple housing for animals outside of human dwellings? Plus, I imagine basic hygiene practices that are not innate. I'm not sure what innate uh, means in this case, but might practices of- I get the gist, I think. Uh, sorry? I think I understand the, the gist yeah. of, of that question. Yeah. It, it, it's, essentially, it's, it's about, uh, if, if I understand right, the, the question is about planning animals out of the picture um, and 
actually, th there are some dangers in doing that. I think it's about planning the management of animals better into the picture. We know from other work that uh, actually also James Hassel, the student whose who's, um, uh, biogeography work I presented there, um, also showed that one of, the, one of the big risks was the way in which waste produced, particularly by urban livestock, was, was managed and how that, the, the mismanagement or lack of management of that waste resulted in the, the risk of transference of antimicrobial resistance to, to people, in fact. So, yes, it's a, it's a real risk. But actually, as I mentioned before, um, people require access to animals for food security. It's not just that animals are all far away on a farm and their products come into the city through these long and complex value chains. It's also that people living in the deep city are raising those animals to produce eggs or to produce milk uh, and so on. And that's essential because those perishable products uh, are needed by the people who live nearby. And so we, we need to, I think, find a way to in some cases, strictly speaking, legalize the keeping of those animals because in, in many places, including in parts of Nairobi, it's illegal to have them, uh, but of course they are kept nonetheless. Um, but to better manage their presence, better manage their waste. Um, we see really nice examples in, in India, for example, of multi-story dairies, for example, that are in the middle of the urban, urban zone, which are clean, well-kept, waste management is appropriately thought out, and they're right next to the next to the consumers, which means the price is kept low for the product. So, we need it's it's about better management of of the animals, which is a veterinary issue. It's about better management of the environment. It's a planning issue and an environmental planning issue. It's about better management of the waste, which is a sort of city council epidemiological issue. So this is really the nexus of where it all all comes together. And but I would hesitate to suggest that we we plan an animals out of the picture because they're really important nonetheless. Brilliant. Uh, on that fantastic note, I think we have to finish. Um, Thank you, Eric. Um, it's two o'clock and I know some people have, um, I'm sorry, Pedro, I couldn't pick up your question, uh, who is based at the Housing and Urban Ministry in Chile now as a former student of ours. Um, but uh, but, uh, but uh, anyway, all this is just the beginning of a lot of thinking, I hope, and I hope it will stimulate you, um, current students, former students, friends, um, to continue working on this. Because I think I insist that we think we, we have a lot to uh, contribute to this work. Uh, and, and again, thank you, Eric, for inviting me and inviting us to this. I've, I've um, posted, as I said, two papers. I've just uh, got there. Two uh, links to two papers. And um, Cecilia Tacoli, who's on the audience, has also posted a third one. Apologies, um, Cecilia, for leaving that one out. So it's, it's our, if you like, social scientists, uh, built environment people contributing to this work. And so there's three papers there that you can actually follow up on. And there's another one to come that we're working on, as I said. Um, and I think there's huge amounts of additional work. Um, this is where UCL is fantastically well placed to, to work because we, you know, we're in a multidisciplinary environment, but also reaching out to people like Eric and his colleagues in Liverpool University and Ilri in Nairobi is, is just a privilege uh, because much more needs to be done around this kind of uh, multidisciplinary work. There's far too much siloing in the way we think about problems and complex problems like this. There's too much simplification and, and not enough about acting in a, in a multidisciplinary across different um, boundaries of ministries and, and secretaries at city level. And that is part of a problem. These things are deeply embedded and therefore there are interests that are built up over the years. And, and the issue of cutting across those disciplines is a very, very hard one. And I think that's, that's where we need to keep working is not only in how to conceive these things in the way that you've done it, um, Eric, but also how do we move forward in terms of policy and, and planning in the field. So, so thank you all very much. Thank you, Eric. Thank you again. Um, to um, Dana and Alex and Haim for hosting us. And, and I wish you all a good afternoon, good evening, rest of the morning, wherever you are, and see you at the next um, DID. Thank you all. See you. Thank you, Julio. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye.